So now that we know what dependent random variables are like, we can look at sequence models. So sequence models are a very specific kind of random models of random variables, namely where we typically have a very nice structure of random variables that depend on each other. And you could probably argue that each of those little ducklings only follows, you know, the duck in front of it. And so you might get, you know, something of that dependency structure rather than something where every duck looks only at mama duck. As if they did that, they would all bunch up together rather than swimming nicely in a row. Okay, so here's the statistical reason why you probably want to get all your ducks in a row. Now, something slightly less amusing, this is what the situation looks like with COVID-19 in Santa Clara County right now. And, well, you might ask yourself, well, you know, is there any structure to it, right? Because, I mean, these are observations, and you can clearly see that there's, you know, some sequential form. And what happens is that, you know, you basically have those observations x1, x2, all the way up to xt. And you want to model the joint distribution between all those random variables rather than just, you know, one at a time. So what you can do, though, is you can always decompose the joint distribution into p of x1 times p of x2 given x1 times pi of x, p of x3 given x1 and x2 up to p of xt given x1 through xt minus 1. That is always the, po the case, regardless of whether I have a time series or not, if I have a bunch of random variables, I can decompose it. The point, though, is that if I have, you know, a time series, then decomposing p of x forward always works better, it's more accurate than working backwards. And it also allows us to predict things going forward. By the way, people who predict things going backwards, they have a name they are called historians and archaeologists, right? Now, in any case, if we have a time series, then a lot of those decompositions can be done much more easily. Let's have a look at it in a concrete example first before we go and actually then, you know, look at the math. So the simplest or, you know, most naive thing you could do, maybe not simplest, it's actually would be very difficult, is to predict, let's say, those variables using the full past. And if you do that, you end up needing a lot of data, you end up with a very complicated model, and even worse, you don't really have that much information about the very long range effects. Okay, so what's one to do? Well, you could make a shorter range. You could only pick a window. Now, in this case, I'm no longer estimating p of xt, given xt minus one all the way up to, you know, p of x one, but I'm only picking that range. And so you might ask, you know, why does that actually make sense? Well, in the case of COVID-19, you can assume that a lot of the temporal behavior depends on what the situation looks like right now. In other words, we probably want to know how many people are infected, how many people, you know, have already had COVID, how many are vaccinated. And, you know, there's a certain time course, uh, temporal behavior for COVID. And so therefore, it probably doesn't help us so much to look back until, you know, February, March 2020, but maybe only looking back for two or three weeks might be quite useful. And then we can go and just, you know, predict this green block given the red one. And then we go further and predict the next block, and then we go further and predict the next one. And so this gives us a pretty good idea of, you know, how we can get the data and how we can model it. More importantly, if we do this, then we have a lot of training data, right? For instance, I could, you know, design a block here, right? And I can train, or I could, for instance, you know, have a block here, and I could train on this too. And so in doing that, 
I actually have a lot of training data available such that then in the end I can go and you know condition on this block and ask what's going on here. Obviously using the future to predict the past well that might not be so cool but at least in this case I can use all this data over here in order to build a better model for there. So here's a simple way how you can do this. Suppose I have this autoregressive problem. So xt is drawn from p of xt given x1 through xt minus 1, right? And that's this graph here. What I can then do is I can say, well, maybe I don't need all those really long range dependencies. So they're just drawn in red now. And then I can throw them all away. So now I only have the black ones. And it turns out this isn't just a hack. There's a theorem which says that this is feasible. So Taken's theorem says that under some benign regularity conditions, using the past tall steps is enough. Now, the one thing Taken's theorem doesn't tell you is exactly how large you should be picking tall. So it's a little bit of a Radio Erevan type of result. In other words, you can say in principle, this decomposition is always possible, but we just don't know exactly how to do it. So nonetheless, even though we don't know how to do it, people still use it and it's still quite effective. So this works if you know the past history has enough data about the next estimate. So basically, you know, if the information about xt can be found in you know the past tall steps and the other thing that we often do is we use reasonable assumptions about the distribution. So we assume that it's stationary and also, so basically that, you know, the next prediction only depends on the actual values rather than the point in time. And then you can go and for instance, train a regression model for yt given it, given, you know, all the ancestors. Now, this is nice and people have used it and this is essentially, you know, state of the art 1980 up to 1990. Some of the better models can be designed this way. The problem is that if you do that, you may actually make it, be making your problem very hard for yourself. Okay, imagine we have something like a traffic light. Okay, and so maybe, you know, it's red, it's red, it's red, then it turns maybe yellow, and then it's green, and then it goes red again, right? In this case, you don't really need to store a lot of other information about, you know, that traffic light. You just have some hidden state, namely, you know, in this case, you know, the color, you know, to predict the next step. In general, traffic lights aren't that easy to predict. For instance, if you have an intersection that's really complicated, then you have, you know, traffic lights for different lanes, different turn signals, pedestrians and cyclists in some cases. And then, you know, there are a lot of interventions like maybe that pedestrian being annoying and pushing a button, then everybody has to stop and he crosses the light, the, the street anyway with the red light. Nonetheless, that hidden state makes it a lot easier to model things. The additional thing is that if we assume that, you know, something like this, for instance, is our hidden state in, or is, is our set of variables to condition on for the next term, I can always rewrite one into the other. So let's actually look at exactly what this hidden state model does. So I assume that I have some function htg, which takes past observations and past hidden state to give me the new hidden state. So that's exactly, you know, this dependency here where past observations and past hidden state together give me the new hidden state. And then I have some function f where the past observation and the current hidden state govern what we get. 
So you can easily see that by the red type of arrows, right? And the green type of arrows, you can completely cover this graph. Now you might ask, you know, is there anything special in the autoregressive model that you couldn't do with a latent variable model? Actually, not really. Because what you could always do is you could just define your hidden state, ht, to be just xt minus 1 up to xt minus tau. And so, therefore, ht can be written as some function g of, you know, xt minus 1 and ht minus 1. And in this case, this function g is a super simple one because all it does is it just shifts everything to the left and throws the last term away and, you know, places something else on the first position. Now, we can clearly imagine a lot of more intelligent functions than that, but you can do that. So this is a common strategy, for instance, hidden Markov models, Kalman filters, time varying, varying topic models. A lot of things follow this structure. So it's been around for decades and it also works for deep learning. In other words, there's no reason why those two functions f and g could not be deep networks. So let's have a look at what this looks like then. And this is really just representing the entire thing as a deep network. There's nothing special to it. The only difference is that I modeled specifically the outputs. You know, OT minus 1, OT, OT plus 1. But I'm basically back in the original setting if I say OT or rather if I say xt plus 1 is ot. In that case, the previous slide holds perfectly. So I have an input xt minus 1. That's combined with some hidden state and some function g. And then it produces an output, you know, f. And yeah, that then gets fed into this again. So basically this green scenario is just one where that happens, right? And when I observe some real data, then this, you know, comes into play. Whereas if I just fantasize some data, then I get this. Okay. So this is a nice approach and it worked quite well, but there's actually quite a serious problem with this approach. One of the issues is that, well, you need to have a rather large hidden state in order to capture a lot of different dependencies. So imagine a situation where I tell you a number, and then I'm going to tell you a hundred useless numbers, and then I'm going to ask you to just reproduce that very first number. If you try encoding something like that with a recurrent neural network, it's very, very difficult for two reasons. First of all, that deep network doesn't necessarily know exactly you know, how to count to 100 and doesn't know when to remember something or not remember something, right? So you would want to have mechanisms that automatically learn when to remember and what to remember and also when to release it again. And the rather ingenious idea in LSTMs, so this is Hochreiter and Schmidhuber in 1998, was to take a computer memory cell, like, you know, a flip-flop, where you have exactly that functionality. You have functionality to remember, functionality to read out, and functionality to reset. And then use that directly, you know, translated into a deep network. Later on, uh, Joe et al. came up with the GRU, so the Gated Recurrent Unit. And this is essentially a simplification of the LSTM. And there are cases when it works just as well as the LSTM. There are quite a few cases where it works an epsilon worse. And then it's more a matter of 
you know, trade-off because you get something that's a lot faster, but it's maybe, you know, slightly less accurate. Okay, so let's actually look at LSTMs. So this really mimics the memory cell in the circuit. So what we have is we have a forget operation, we have an input operation, we have an output operation, and then we have memory. So the forget gate does exactly that. It governs whether the current memory cell should forget what it knows. And so if the forget gate is small, right, then what you get is that the output of the forget gate as it's multiplied with the memory cell just, you know, nukes that value. Okay. The input gate takes the observations here and, you know, uses them to decide whether to actually, you know, look at, you know, the new observation. And then furthermore, it's the input itself is transformed through tang into something that may possi possibly become a candidate memory. And this is then simply added to the memory. So the partially forgotten memory plus the maybe partially noticed new data is what goes into the new memory cell. Then what you do is you take that memory, you transform it, but you also have an output gate and the combination of those two terms then governs whether you can actually observe the hidden state or whether you're just going to get a zero. Now this looks very bizarre and you could argue that probably they spent a fair amount of time coming up with that specific structure. There's actually a series of, series of two, three other papers that do nothing else but improve it slightly. The modifications are quite slight. I mean, there's some, something called peephole connections and so on that allows you to do things slightly better. For all intents and purposes, just treat LSTM as a standard building block in a deep network framework. Okay, so here are the equations that I mentioned before. I'm not going to bore you with the very details. This is just a standard multi, you know, just a standard perceptron here for the input forget and output gate. And the only thing where things are slightly different is that for the memory cell, I'm now using, okay, and I have a typo here, there needs to be a plus, the forget gate times the, you know, previous state of the cell plus the input gate times, you know, that tang, and then I get some bias, right? So this is basically the new candidate, and then the hidden state is just read out accordingly. So there are slight differences for different definitions of that hidden gate, but just treat the LSTMs as a standard terminal. Now, there is one way how you can make this faster, namely if you do not specifically distinguish between a reset and a forget gate. In other words, you use the same logic to decide whether you, you know, you know, this transforms your features, but basically you get, you know, the operation, you know, how much you remember and how much you emit. And so basically it's just a significant reduction in the number of operations that the GRU can do. The benefit of doing that, it's about half the number of operations that are needed, is that it's twice as fast. In many cases, it's just as good. So for instance, if you think about it, the GRU only has a hidden state, whereas before that, we really had two hidden states, namely we had the memory and the hidden state itself. So the GRU does away with that and just uses you know, one unified representation for both. And when it works, it's a good idea. Now, the more interesting thing though is, you know, how do we make it more complex? And we actually run into the same issue as what people encountered for convolutional neural networks. So if you recall, in convnets, at some point there was this 
ambiguity whether we should be designing networks that are shallow but that have fairly wide convolutional kernels or whether we should design networks that are fairly deep but have fairly narrow convolutional kernels. Because if you think about it, after you know, applying multiple convolutional kernels, you know, the field increases. So that's one option. The other option is to have you know, maybe just one fairly wide kernel and then with the next one it increases even further. And so I can get the same width or possibly a larger width with maybe two or three convolutions as I can get with maybe 10. It turns out though that those deep and narrow networks work better than the fat and shallow ones. And it turns out that the same thing is also the case for RNNs. Namely, I could have made the individual LSTM cells more complicated by replacing the perceptrons with a multi-layer perceptron. Instead, what turns out to be a better idea is, is if you use the hidden state for one layer as the input for the next one, and you keep on doing this. And one of the key issues now is that you have this interesting dependency structure, right? Where these variables depend on each other. Right. With you moving up and to the right, and as such, if you want to compute the gradient, the gradient has to walk through that wavefront. And that can cost a lot of operations in order to do that. It's also not necessarily very stable. So in practice, what we do is we go and truncate those chains. Let's say, for instance, we truncate them here. And in doing so, you end up with rather computationally more attractive situations, it turns out that it also works better because it acts as a slight regularizer. Now even better, the deep learning framework usually has pretty sensible defaults as to what you should be using there. So start with those before you do anything fancy. And with that, we conclude the RNNs.